Our Father, we humbly come before thee, and uh, once again, we never cease to give you thanks for who you are and for what you've done for us in Christ. Most especially, we thank you for Calvary and what has been accomplished at the cross through his substitutionary sacrifice. Thank you for accepting it as the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins by his resurrection from the grave. Thank you that we have, we can have the full assurance that our, <clears throat> your outraged justice has been adequately satisfied to the perfect sacrifice of your sinless son. And what a blessing that is. And Father, today or tonight, again, we thank you for the opportunity to study the treasures of your word, particularly in the gospel on salvation. And uh, <clears throat> we pray that uh, we will see that salvation is a loaded truth that not only covers our justification when we receive Christ as Savior, but since we receive Christ as Savior, we are enjoying your deliverance, not only from the penalty, but also now from the power of sin and thankful for the guarantee of being delivered from it, from sin in its presence on the day of glorification. Now we ask for your Holy Spirit once again <clears throat> to uh, illumine our hearts and minds. Like David, we pray that you'd open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy word and we shall thank you for it. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so uh, once again, good evening to everybody else. And let me see, Joy, that uh, you are now in the, is that pink of health? Okay, or uh, <clears throat> you mentioned pink and that's that uh, looks like a color. And like I said, I'm colored blind. So I got lost in my, my <laughs> understanding. Yes, good evening, Joyce. Um, <clears throat> Um, we last time we started looking at, we, we kept on looking at the doctrines of salvation. And we have been harping on the fact that our salvation is wholly dependent upon the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he has done on Calvary. In other words, because of who he is, that's his person, he is capable of saving us. Nobody else is capable of saving us except the unique sinless son of god okay so buddha allah muhammad whoever you whatever have you whatever <clears throat> idol it is has no capacity even if he is willing to save he is not capable or able to save now the person of christ is not sufficient because even if a person is able to save but he is not willing to save then we will not be saved so jesus christ is both able because of his person and is capable and willing and we know that he is willing because he was willing to lay down his life for our sins so he is the only he's not only a perfect savior he is the only qualified savior and therefore jesus said unless you believe that i am me you will die in your sins <clears throat> now uh, uh, joyce had a question last time during this past week about uh, trying to connect the dots between uh, not on, our union with Christ, not only with regard to our death, but also our resurrection and our ascension. And how does that have anything to do with uh, being delivered from, from the power of Satan? So I hope that kind of uh, sunk, because it, it, for me as a Christian before, it also took a while for me to, uh, to grasp that and see how, what does it got to do? What does the ascension have anything to do with my being delivered from Satan's power? So just in case you have any questions along those lines, then we can refer to that and I can give you the answer via email that I gave uh, Joyce. But this is where we left off last time. So we were trying to relate the work of Christ, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and in fact, his sending of the Holy Spirit and his coming again uh, uh, to our salvation, to our deliverance and how it affects our daily walk. And we ended up last week by saying, listen, our salvation is so rich and so great so that if any believer or professing Christian is living in defeat, therefore he's not, he is living an abnormal Christian life <clears throat> because the normal Christian life is the victorious Christian life. Okay? 
This is not to say we will not be bogged down by the devil. This is not to say we will not struggle with the flesh. This is not to say the allurements of the world system will that we will not wrestle with them. But still, uh, <clears throat> there is always deliverance or victory, even in the process of sanctification. Uh, to as we face the challenges of our day-to-day -day struggles in this fallen world. <clears throat> so we left off last week also by looking at uh, these passages on making our calling and election sure. Uh, that's borrowed from the words of uh, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1. We are to make our calling and election sure. Okay? We have to make sure that uh, we are saved, that we are among God's elect. Paul mentioned it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and says, examine yourself whether you are in the faith. Prove your own selves, except you be reprobate. So this is an exam that we all have to go through. Examining ourselves, lest we fall into this, uh, you know, this mindset of uh, the people of uh, <clears throat> Israel during the days of uh, Nebuchadnezzar or Judah, this is the people of Judah, when they said, the harvest has passed, the summer's ended, and we still are not saved after two years of expecting deliverance and no salvation still. And then here, uh, the same thing, uh, yeah, making a calling an election, sure. So during our first class, somebody ra raised the question, how can we be sure that we are justified? And this is exactly <clears throat> the lesson that will answer that question, okay? Uh, but uh, I started last week, or I'd say I ended last week by pointing out that uh, being sure of salvation is a biblical thing. This is not a pie in the sky and a positive thinking approach. To, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, therefore it will be saved. You know, whatever mind can conceive, um, the, the person will achieve something like that. Is, this is not a positive thinking thing. Uh, the Bible gives us clear examples of people, believers, like you and I, who were sure. The Apostle Paul did assure the saints at Philippi that they were to be confident of this very thing, that he, referring to God, which hath begun a good work in you, which is the work of salvation, he will perform it, bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul was assuring these saints of that. The Apostle Paul himself uh, expressed his confidence of his assurance when he said in 2 Timothy 1, 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, but I know I believe and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The word persuaded means inward. He had inward certainty. And of course, even an Old Testament saint like King David, uh, said in this popular psalm, Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. He's not talking about in the temple. He's talking about in the house of the Lord forever, for all eternity. <clears throat> Thus, all of that to say that Christian uh, salvation or assurance of salvation is a biblical thing. Now, remember this slide, uh, common perversions of Christianity. We looked at this in our previous lessons. Uh, just for us to be reminded, I think we can never overemphasize this because there are many inside professed Christian churches who are resting in or having their confidence in, not in Christ alone. Uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, the true believer has no confidence in the flesh. And this will be considered flesh if people are trusting in their church in their compliance of regulations, in their service, whether that be teaching Sunday school class or um, passing out gospel tracts or uh, let's say singing in the choir uh, service or even some emotional religious experience. If we are depending or confident that we are saved because of these things, then we have a perverted kind of Christianity. <clears throat> because as we reminded we reminded ourselves last time, our Christianity does not revolve around what we can do. It revolves everything in what he has done for us. It's based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. It revolves around his person, his word, and his work. And that is why, you know, there is a common, there seems to be a, 
uh, a particular teaching that is gaining ground or gaining popularity in many professed Christian circles today. Sometimes it's called Lordship Salvation, <clears throat> wherein advocates of this doctrine say that you have to give your all, you have to commit yourself to Christ in order to be saved. It so happens that, uh, you know, last Sunday I, I was preaching in Philippians chapter 3 and, uh, you know, when Paul placed his, his own life in a ledger and he compared his achievements, his accomplishments before he got saved, and even after he got saved and compared it with the righteousness of Christ. And he did not say, I'm going to give my good works, my being a circumcised of the eighth day, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm going to give my all to you, Lord, so that you can give your all to me. That's not what Paul said in Philippians 3. He said, all the best accomplishments I've had, and they're not wrong in themselves, they're not wicked in themselves, but all these good works, I count them loss. In the next verse, verse 8, I count them but dung. All the English word, <clears throat> which means garbage, rubbish. Uh, lexicon tells us it's the word which means an excretion of the animal. So it's, a, it's that bad. All of our best achievements are counted as excrements compared to the riches of the grace of Christ and his righteousness. So that's what Paul is talking about as far as our salvation is concerned. So if anyone had, had something to brag about, it was Paul. But he said, all of what I can brag about compared to others is not going to save me. So he really pointed out in scripture that salvation is dependent wholly on Christ. He's not right, not his church, not his compliance or regulation, not his service, not his religious experience. Because although these are not wrong themselves, like I said earlier, these are the results of grace, never the causes of it. So I think it bears to repeat that remember the grounds of our salvation is the person and work of Jesus Christ. These are some of the passages to support that. The means to salvation is by grace through faith, okay? And therefore, the uh, result or the evidence of salvation is a, a good work so, or a transformed life. So never mix these up. To do so will result in heresy and will give people false hopes. We are not saved because I gave my all to Christ or I committed my life to Christ. I am saved because of what Christ has done for me. That's the grounds. And how can Christ's death on Calvary and the benefits of his righteousness become mine? The means through faith. And if we're genuinely saved, there's going to be the evidence of salvation, which is a transformed life. You don't fabricate the evidence. It just comes as a spontaneous result of genuine Bible salvation. So let's talk about the assurance of salvation back again. So how do we know we're justified? How do we know we're truly saved? So here are a number of uh, pillars to make sure so that we have confidence that we are saved, that this is not merely a positive thinking uh, thing. It's basically based on what God himself says. The promises of God is number one. I know I'm saved and you will know you're saved because God himself promised it and here's some of the promises he that believeth on him he is the grounds of our salvation remember he is not condemned but he that believes not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god again in verse 36 he that believeth in the son hath everlasting life it's not the believing that saves you it's the son that saves you and you're putting your trust in christ as the means to appropriate all that Christ is for our salvation. He that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Okay, so even if you believe, if you have good works, you have church, you have, see, you're not believing in the Son. You're believing in your accomplishments. And that's the reason why in Matthew chapter 7, that often quoted passage, remember when Jesus said, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So why were, not, why were they not allowed entry into heaven? And they said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works? Aha, uh -huh. see, that's the problem. The reason why the Lord never knew them, even in spite of the fact that they did, is because why? Because their confidence is not in Christ. Their conscience, Lord, we should enter heaven because we have done many wonderful works. 
Their confidence is in their works and their merit, not the, not the merits of Christ. Another promise, verily, verily, I said to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And he shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Another promise in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus is not saying the requirements of being his sheep. This is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the uh, marks of genuine sheep. Genuine sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me because they're already sheep. See, They don't follow me in order to become sheep. They follow me because they are my sheep. And I give, notice that he, he didn't say I lend unto them eternal life. He's no Indian giver. He said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. This is even more interesting in the Greek language because the word never perish is in the double negative. <clears throat> Meaning to say uh, in English, as it is in Tagalog, I, I'm not so sure if in Singaporean or Chinese, when you say a give a double negative, that uh, could mean a positive. In math, it's the same, right? Two negatives mean a positive. But in Greek, a double negative simply means emphasis. That's why they did not translate that they shall not perish. That would be a one negative. This is a double negative. They shall no never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all. And no one is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Beautiful promise. Uh, <clears throat> qualities of Christ's genuine sheep. None is able to pluck them out of my hand. That's Christ's hand and my father's hand. That's double security for his sheep. So are you one of his? I hope so. And that's how, how do you know you're one of his sheep? Well, it says he that believes in him. Again, Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we have the promises of God. So there are many other promises, but here's another ground or pillar of for our salvation. These are the pillars so that I know I'm saved, and this is how you will know for sure that you are saved, or the meaning to say you are justified, is the purposes of God, okay? God, that's why Romans 8, 28, every trial that we face on earth, we can say we know all things. Well, even what you're going through right now, what we're going through, whatever dregs or trials we're faced with, all things work together for good. To whom? To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. So these are believers. For whom he did foreknow. Apparently it does go that stretches all the way back since eternity past. God foreknew. And whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And for what purpose? So that he might be, Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And that happened in time for the believer. And whom he called, he justified. That happened also in time after responding to the gospel. And then whom he justified, then he also glorified. Okay, so a number of things that are worth taking note here. Did you notice that that is an unbreakable chain? Whom he foreknew, he predestinated to be confirmed to the image of son. Whom he predestinated, him he called, and whom he called, he justified. And the chain does not break there. It goes all the way to glorify. And that's God's purpose for his children. So, and secondly, well, another thing worth noting here is notice, did you notice all the words there are in the past tense, including glorified? It's in the past, although we know that's not yet a reality today for us believers. It is yet future, but at least in the mind of God, um, uh, in accordance with God's divine purposes, it's already a done deal. And that's a beautiful promise for every child of his, whom he justified definitely will be glorified because that's part of God's purpose for every one of his children. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's pillar number two. Pillar number three is the provision of God. Okay, <clears throat> How do I know that I'm saved? Well, because of what God has provided for me and for you. 
Romans 8, 31, Paul is here arguing like a lawyer and he said, what shall we say then to these things? Remember, this is a continuation of verse 30, no, 31, Romans 8. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not him with not with him also freely give us all things? <clears throat> See, and then <clears throat> he says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. In other words, it's a rhetorical question. Who's going to lay a charge against God's elect, God's people, those whom he has redeemed? Who? And of course, the answer to that question is no one. Why? Because the judge himself is the one who has declared the sinner righteous. So nobody can accuse us because the judge, the eternal judge, has already declared the sinner righteous in his sight. So no one can charge us uh, anything before God. So the fourth uh, pillars, remember the first is the promises of God, second, the purposes of God, second, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, what was the uh, third one? Uh, again, let's look at that. The purposes of God. And the third one is the <clears throat> provision of God, okay? <clears throat> and that is Christ's provision through his son. Okay, so let's go back to the next slide here. So the fourth, pro, per, fourth pillar is, are the prayers of Jesus Christ. It's a blessing to know that sometimes when people say, we're praying for you, what a blessed assurance that is. Or the pastor's praying for you. You're praying for the pastor. That's great of comfort. But you know what? More than our prayers for each other, Jesus promised. This is God the Son praying for his children. Continuation of Romans 8. Who is he that condemns? Who will condemn us? Satan? The non-believer? And remember, it is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. And it is he himself who is even at the right hand of God, speaking of his ascension, and he also maketh intercession for us. So who can who who, who has the capacity to condemn us when the judge has declared us righteous and he, Christ himself is the one who died for our sins and rose again, is now at the right hand of the Father. And he even makes intercession for us. Now this is not talking about his this is talking about his ascension. And here we can see another connection between the ascension of Christ and our deliverance from Satan. Recall Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. We have here Simon being tempted by the devil. And you know what Jesus said? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But you know why Satan, why, why, why Simon was uh, never fell all the way? He may have stumbled, he may have fallen, but he never was taken from the hand of God. You know why? Because I have prayed for thee, Jesus said. And that's what Jesus is doing for believers. He is now sitting in the right hand of the Father, ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he said, I prayed for thee so that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So what a blessing. Christ's intercessory work. Uh, as he is now ascended up on high is one of the grounds or pillars why we know that we are saved, that we will never fall from grace. And then fifthly is the power of God. Okay? Can you think of any power greater than God's power? There is none. And this is exactly what Peter, through his inspired pen, assures his readers. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, he hath born again, begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance. So we were spiritual that he has raised it together new the of life in Christ so that we can have an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away. And this inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. And to him is Peter talking to believers. You who are what? Kept by what? The power of God through faith unto salvation, 
ready to be revealed in the last, in the last time. Kept by the power of God. That's a description of every believer. That's why Peter says, blessed be the God. That word blessed means happy. Okay, happy is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine what God has done to the extent so that his own power preserves us from falling. Folks, so, those are the pillars of, of our salvation. Now let's talk about some evidences of Bible salvation. In other words, if you and I were riding on a highway and eventually we, we uh, <clears throat> face a car accident, a, cr a crash, okay? And uh, so finally the paramedics come and they see bodies on the highway and what normally will the paramedics do? Okay, they'll try to attend to these casualties. And uh, the, one of the first things that they will do is try to get your pulse and check if there are signs of life. It is the same for us as believers. Okay, how do we know that we have life in Christ? There has to be some evidences, some proofs some indications and those proofs or evidences are not fabricated they are already indications of what we possess life okay so <clears throat> this is exactly the what john addresses in his first epistle okay remember one of the reasons why john wrote his epistle first john is he said he said first first john 5 13 these things have i written unto you that believe in the name of the son of god for what reason so that you may know that you have eternal life, okay? One of the reasons for writing First John. So if you're not even sure yet that you have eternal life, First John is a good book to read through prayerfully and check out what are some of the tests that John, through his inspired pen, lays down in that five-chapter epistle to figure out, do I really pass the test? Do I have life? So I'm going to lay down to you these tests <clears throat> and check it out for yourself. Examine yourself, whether you are in the faith. Will you pass the test? Do you have the signs of life? Okay, first is the admission test. A genuinely saved person will have to pass this test. That is, he admits he is a sinner, okay? He is not sinless, okay? In fact, he admits his sinfulness. And thus, that is why he needs the Savior. Okay? That's the reason we called upon Christ, because he saw, he saw himself a guilty sinner deserving condemnation, and there is no way he can get out of that rut through human merit. So he needed, that's why he called upon Christ as Savior. This is what John said in that section of Scripture. If we say, so notice John carefully words this, if we say, and then therefore we are not, or something like that. So if we say, that is, if we profess, one thing to profess Christianity, it is another to possess Christ. There is no point professing Christianity if we do not possess Christ. And of course, the evidence of possessing Christ is in our personal walk. Okay, so here's John saying, first, the first test, if we say that we have no sin, Therefore, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So is anybody here who's saying, I've never sinned, Pastor? Can you, can you raise your hand? And if you raise your hand, I know you're not saved <laughs> because you're lying again. Okay. <clears throat> so the truth is not in us. That's, that's what God's word says. But if we confess our sins, that word confess, homo logeo, to say the same thing. Okay, logo is word and homo is the same, like homosexual. So the same, homo logeo, to say the same thing. Logo means to say or to, to study. So if we the same thing with God, God says, I have sinned. You have sinned. And you take sides with God and say, okay, Lord God, you're right. I, am, I agree with you. I take sides with you that there's no way I'm I a sinless person. So if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But again, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and therefore his word is not in us. Okay. So have you passed the admission test? Okay. So I hope so, because anybody who says, and I've encountered people who say that, that they have never sinned. 
And that's why they think they're going to heaven. Uh, I know for a fact from the lens of scripture that they are both lying, making God a liar, and therefore they're not saved. Okay, so second test, the obedience test. Let's ask yourselves this question. Can I pass this test? So here you are. We are the ones who got into this crash. The paramedics got us out from the highway and subjected us to certain tests. Does he have life? So, second test, the obedience test. A genuine believer cannot live a lifestyle of sin. This is not to say believers do not sin. We already said that, we saw that in 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, then we are deceiving ourselves. <clears throat> so, the second test is not a contradiction of the first test. <clears throat> Rather, the second test uh, only enhances the first test. Yes, we do sin, but if we do sin, that does not mean we continually, habitually live a lifestyle of sin. That Christians, although fallible, still, generally speaking, lives a lifestyle of obedience. But we may fumble, stumble, fall, but to habitually, continually, perpetually live a lifestyle of sin, there is reason to raise that question mark. Is that person really saved? Okay. So notice these verses. <clears throat> First John 2, 4 to 6. He that says, he that professes, I know him. And that he does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Her, hereby know we that we are in him. He that says or professes that he abides in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. <clears throat> so generally speaking, you and I as believers are not sinless, but we will sin less okay, and live more and more as we continue in our progressive sanctification, more and more unto Christ-likeness <clears throat> and matter therefore manifest more holiness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, number three test is the social test. So, have you passed the admission test? How are we doing with the obedience test? Okay, and then the test number three, the social test. And a, a genuine believer loves the brethren. And he should not be surprised if the world, the unsaved world, hates him. Okay, notice first John 2 9 to 10. He that says, or professes he is in the light. He claims to be a Christian, he's in the light. And yet he hates his brother. That man who professes Christianity is still, is still in darkness until now. But he that loves his brother abides in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Okay. Further in 1 John chapter 3, 11 to 14, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's what Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> now, not like Cain, who was of that wicked one, and he slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed, notice, we have passed from death unto life. How do we know that? Because we love the brethren. And he that loves not his brother abides in death. Did you notice if a person is genuinely saved, somehow God, <clears throat> of course, slowly but surely uh, changes our affections, our thought processes, as we love the word of God to shape our thinking. And therefore, as it changes our affections, it will change our lifestyle, our decision making, and eventually our conduct. See? A person who says he's a Christian, and then he goes to church, and he keeps looking at his watch and say, boy, how long is this preacher going to preach? You know, I'm getting to be uncomfortable here. Well, the reason why he's not comfortable there is perhaps because he's not a Christian. We have the saying, birds of a feather flock together. So uh, <clears throat> if a person is a believer, he will find himself in good company, comfortable with fellow believers. 
But if he claims to be a Christian, he seems to be more comfortable with the world and that he hates the brother, the, the brethren, then he's like Cain. Why does he hate the brethren? Because his own deeds were evil. So do we hate some professing Christian? Mm -hmm. Then am I passing this test? Am I really still wanting in this area? Again, these are not uh, means to salvation. Remember, these are the evidences of salvation. So John says, do not be surprised if the word will hate you because they're of the devil, they're unsaved. And if you're a Christian, they will hate you because of your lifestyle, you're walking in the light. And therefore, their, your light is exposing their darkness and their guilt. So it's either they see their, their filth through, you know, through the light that they see in you, and therefore they confess their sin and get right with God, repent of it, or they cover their guilt and put off the light uh, that you show through persecution or even martyrdom, see? <clears throat> so that's the social test. Genuine believers will find himself comfortable with fellow believers. As the saying goes, you know, if you see a person who he walks like a duck, talks like a duck, dresses up like a duck, speaks like a duck, do you think what it is? It can't be a chicken, obviously. It is a duck. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and I have never seen chickens comfortably fellowshipping with ducks because birds of a feather flock together. So anyway, I hope you got the point there. The social test is one indicator that we have the signs of life. Fourthly, the doctrinal test. A genuine believer who knows, uh, knows who he has trusted. Because the Bible says, who serve believes where? In him, in Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life so you place your trust in a person and there's a sense you may not know every point of theology regarding christ and his work but you know you place your trust in christ <clears throat> when you got saved that doesn't mean you have comprehensive understanding of the doctrine of christ or or all the theological ramifications of it but at least you know that the object of your faith is Christ. Now, here's what John said. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. And whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Perhaps you're familiar with some laborers or even loved ones who have been hooked up into the cults. We have here the Iglesia de Christos. Maybe you have there, as we have it here, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and other, or even the Muslims, whatever, uh, other religious systems. And you ask them, who is Jesus Christ to you? For the Iglesia de Cristo, Jesus Christ is only a man. And even if he claims to have been saved because he's a member of this church, but he says, well, I believe Jesus Christ, but I believe he's merely a man and he's not God. He fails the doctrinal test. He's not saved. Okay. A Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. There's seven dead beds. I believe in Jesus Christ. All right. And am I saved? Well, then if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your faith is resting in Christ and his finished work. And say, yeah, I'm I believe in him, they say. Yeah, so if you were to die today, do you know where you're going? Yeah, I believe in him. Where are you going? In heaven. Well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I go to the church. Okay, so again, the he's resting. He is mentioning or enumerating the perversions of Christianity. In other words, he does not know his real savior. And the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is the highest creation of God, that he is not co-equal with the Father nor with the Holy Spirit. So he fails the doctrinal test. So they come up with another Jesus, another Christ, and therefore in so doing, they deny the real Jesus. And here's what John is saying here. He that denies the, the Son, the, uh, uh, yeah, he that whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. Of course, in John's day, there were no Iglesia and the Christian show was with us. And who was the fighting to me? He was the fighting to the Gnostics who claimed to be Christians. And Gnosticism believed that while Jesus is God, 
they could not conceive of God becoming flesh because anything that was flesh or is sinful for the Gnostics. So they did not, uh, if the English and the Christians here do not believe Jesus is God, the Gnostics did not believe that Jesus is man, only God. So they failed the doctrinal test. They're denying the real Jesus. And therefore, by denying the real Jesus, they deny the Father also. Are we dealing with our four tests so far, the doctrinal test? Okay. <clears throat> Um, I, I stayed in the dorm one time and uh, as a young Christian, and it was owned by Iglesia Ni Cristo people. So they had some magazines, religious magazines, in the uh, in the lobby. <clears throat> and when you read their, these uh, publications, they talk about changed lives. They talk about, you know, when I entered the Iglesia Ni Cristo, I gave up my vice, I gave up this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it appears that, wow. Their lives did change. And then I trust in Christ. But when you read further, they're actually trust. And I'm, I'm saved because I'm not part of the Iglesia de Cristo. So therefore, they're, they're failing in the doctrinal test. Therefore, in a sense, they really are not saved. Okay, so. Still other verses on the doctrinal test. Okay, a general believer knows he is trusted, and that and that's who Jesus is. First John 4 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is, this is what I'm saying here. John was addressing the heresy of Gnosticism. They did not believe Christ became man. So every spirit that confesses not Jesus Christ's confession, uh, every that confesses that Jesus Christ is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come in the flesh, is not of God. And this that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God. In contrast, writing to his readers, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They, notice those pronouns, you, they. They are those who are outside. You are those who belong to the family. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. And he that knoweth God hears us. And he that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there are cults who have flawed, view, flawed views about Jesus Christ. And if they fail in the doctrinal test, <clears throat> therefore, they're probably not saved. First John 4, 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Son of God. In that phrase, the Son of God speaks of his deity. God dwelleth in him and he in God. Okay. So that's the uh, doctrinal test. So there might be people, you know, who they say they believe in Jesus and they say they're saved. But if you ask for the word, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, it's because I go to church because I, so they start mentioning the perversions of Christianity rather than saying, and I'm saying because of who Christ is and who's that Christ? If you make a follow-up question, these diagnostic, who is that Christ that you have trusted? Well, at least in our church, he is only a man. Or in our church, he is the highest creation of God. So you know that this person is not saved because the object of his faith is Christ. He professes, but it is not the Christ of the Bible. So he fails in the doctrinal test. To be saved, you have to pass all these tests. Okay, 100%. You cannot be passing one, two tests and then fail on the others. So we've seen the admission test. The uh, doctrinal test, the social test, the obedience test. Now let's look at the divine illumination test. This is kind of a little bit subjective, but nonetheless, John mentions this. A genuine believer has a certain affinity towards the things of God, okay? towards the truth of God and the things of God. See, like I said earlier, when a person gets genuinely saved, God the Holy Spirit works in his mind and in his heart 
and somehow renews his affections, not just his ethics, not just his conduct. This conduct will follow because of a renewing that's taking place in his mind and in his affections so that he has a certain affinity towards the things of God. So here's what John said in 1 John chapter 2, little children, it is the last time. And as you heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. And whereby we know that it is the last time. And notice, even in the first century, there were splits that took place. There were a group of people who came out from us. And they actually, in context, are referring to the Gnostics. Professing to be Christians, but they came out from us, John said. But really, they were not of us. For if they had been of us, then they would not have continued with us. But they went out. And their coming out was what? So that they might be made manifest. It would be revealed that they were not really all of us. However, in contrast, you, John, addressing the believer, have an unction from the Holy One. And that's the Holy Spirit. And you know all things. Not that he, he because he has an unction from the Holy Spirit, means he becomes all of a sudden omniscient. But he knows the things of God that God has revealed to him. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but that you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? So here again, John is referring to partly the doctrinal test. He that denies Christ is a liar. He is Antichrist and that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father. See, it's impossible to know God without knowing the Christ of the Bible. Okay, So if you deny the Son, there's no way you know the God of the Bible. Because uh, you deny the Son, you deny the Father also. Um, and But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If, you, if that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. And he says, and these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. False teachers. Context, the Gnostics. They're seducing you to another Christ. But the anointing, remember we talked about an unction from the Holy One, the anointing which comes from the Holy Spirit, which you have received of him abides in you and you need not that any man teach you. But it's the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. See. So if a person is a genuine believer, he will not just, he may fumble, he may stumble, but when he gets back to his senses and realizes, well, how can I turn my back on my Savior who died for my sins and rose again for me? See, so, uh, and like, like my personal testimony, you know, I've been a Christian since 1974, so I'm now this October 47 in the Christian life. And I remember through high school, through college, those uh, Roman Catholic professors and uh, theologians, of course, were trying to convince me of their faith. And despite being bombarded with that, or even secular humanists or scientists who talk about evolution, with all of that bombardment in a secular university, it's easy to come out of a university like that, then come out, turn out your faith being wobbly. Well, you know, because of, because, of, because of being in Christ, I know that the Holy Spirit indwells in me. I have that unction from the Holy One. So then even if I try to read the arguments, let's say, of an evolutionist, it just does not make sense. See, the believer has a certain bias towards the things of God, just like the unbeliever has a certain bias against the things of God. See, so... Uh, and thankfully for believers, because of the Holy Spirit within, then therefore we have that unction from him. Okay, so 
still some verses on the divine illumination test somehow the holy spirit illumines us and tells us what is truth and what is error he that and of course the holy spirit tells us that through his inspired word he who is authored by the holy spirit first john 24 he that keepeth his commandments dwells in him and he in him and hereby we know that he abides in us how do we know that by the spirit which he hath given us. Okay. Another verse. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. How? Because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. And whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God. God dwells in him and he in God. So you have a mixture of the divine illumination test and the doctoral test uh, being mentioned here. <clears throat> okay, so the challenge I leave to you. Having seen all of these tests, how are we doing with these lab tests? Do we have the science of life? Okay. And uh, how do we, as we look at those pillars, of all that Christ has done on our behalf. Okay, so the pillar of his promises, the pillar of his purpose, the pillar of his prayers, and all of that we mentioned earlier, see, <clears throat> that should make it settle the believer's hearts into, like the Apostle Paul, we can say, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I permitted him against that day. In my case, it took my first four years of my Christian life. I knew I was saved when I trusted in Christ, but somehow I was wondering, I just might lose it. I thought my life, my Christian life was like an insurance policy in the sense that, you know, when you get a insurance policy, uh, you're covered. And for as long as you pay premiums, you're covered. But if I stop paying my premiums, then uh, and my due date is passed. I have at least thirty more days uh, grace period, and if that uh, is all also over, then I'm no longer covered. So somehow I thought I had to keep on doing good works in order to make sure that I'm safe, and which meant I realized later on after four years of the Christian life, oh, so therefore in a sense I'm still resting in what I can do to pay my to pay for my coverage. When the truth is, Christ has paid it all. Well, that's when I started relinquishing my self-righteousness and completely trusting in Christ the Savior. So anyway, any questions, therefore? This concludes our study on the, uh, you know, the assurance of salvation, or how do you know who's genuine or fake okay, uh, in the Christian life? Remember, we are to... Uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, examine herself. What is Lordship Salvation? Okay, Lordship Salvation is the teaching that uh, basically says for your person to be saved, you have to accept Christ as not only Savior, but also as Lord. Which means if you, if, uh, if you really are saved, then you have to Commit yourself to Christ. These are his third terms. Commit yourself to Christ. Give your all to him so that he will give his all to you. Okay. In order to be saved. And unless you give your everything to him, you will be damned. These are their, these are their words. And if you listen carefully, that sounds like I have to give my all in order to be saved. What have I to give to Christ? I have nothing to give to him. In fact, even the best of my good works are but dung, garbage. So how can I uh, be saved by giving my all to him? When Paul himself said, all the best of my good works are even trash, rubbish, uh, dung. Okay, so therefore, I have to be saved. I have to what? I have to acknowledge I'm spiritually bankrupt and therefore I have to strip myself of all self-righteousness and through faith be clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. See, <clears throat> uh, I, some of these people are, I believe are believers. It's just that uh, 
I think they are addressing a valid problem in the church, but they're offering the wrong solution. Let me tell you what I mean. Say, so these advocates of Lordship Salvation will tell you, you know, there's carnality in the church. And because there is, and that's a fact. So they have diagnosed a problem. And because there's carnality in the church, this is their solution. Maybe the reason why they have, there was carnality in the church is because they did not receive Christ the Savior properly. And maybe they received Christ as Savior, but they did not receive Christ as Lord. And they go back to, uh, to you know, when you got saved. The, root, the truth is, there is carnality in the church, and we it's because even amongst believers, if a person is a believer, he's saved. And if he's a believer, there are times we yield to the flesh. And that's where carnality takes place. When a believer yields to the flesh, then he yields to the carne, flesh. Therefore, he becomes carnal. Did not Paul say to the Corinthians, are you not carnal? He calls them brethren. Are you not carnal and walk as men? See, so uh, so there. These are efforts of. Uh, I believe they're sincere, but they're trying to address a so a genuine problem by offering the wrong solution. And the the, the problem here is that these are two extreme sides of the pendulum. The one side of the pendulum is lordship salvation. What is the other side of the pendulum? Is you just receive Christ the Savior, and by that they mean this is the problem of easy believism. Okay. Has been popularized in many professed Christian circles, especially from the West. Uh, you just have to pray this prayer and you're saved, okay, without necessarily having a transformed life. So, yes, the Bible says, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But if he really believed in Christ, there's going to be the evidence. So, easy believism is a problem. It's like saying, all you need to do is to pray. And even if you don't have any transformed life, you'll go to heaven. So that's what they call easy believism. It's been popularized by American preachers like John, Jack Hiles and the like. So they fill in their, uh, their pews with so many professions of faith, but there's hardly any transformation. The other side of the pendulum is Lordship Salvation. So I believe these are two ditches. You have the left ditch and the right ditch. When uh, they're, or they're both uh, canals that will f let you fall off. The truth is in the radical center. And I think the radical center can be presented by saying, listen, genuine salvation is like this. The grounds of salvation is what? It's not receiving Christ. It's not good works. The grounds is the finished work of Christ. The means to salvation is not good works. It's not committing my life to Christ. The means is faith. And then the evidence of salvation is a transformed life. And that's exactly correct. That's why the hymn writer said, nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. That's exactly right. All right, in China, there are more cults that teaches other forms of salvation. Uh, perhaps, I mean, that's true everywhere else, including here. Perhaps you people are more uh, in a better position to answer that as to how it is in China. It's just that we are all living in this eastern part of the world. And usually in this eastern part of the world, mysticism is predominant. Okay? That's why even here, we have Chinese people here and uh, they are engaged in Buddhism, Eastern mysticism. They worship, uh, they have ancestral worship, they have superstition. All of that is as part of Eastern culture. That's why in, in the Eastern world where we are, uh, the question is, there are many gods. Who is the true God? Okay. In the Western world where there's so much rationalism and reasoning, the question is, is there a God? See? So they have secularized their mindset to the point that they even doubt whether their God really exists. So in the Western world, is there a God? In the Eastern world, how many gods are there? And who among them is the true one? And both are wrong. Because God has offers us the truth through his word. That there is one God uh, in three persons. And that one of them 
became flesh to die to atone for our sins. And that's the ground of our salvation. So that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Any other questions? I hope that answers your questions. I think <laughs> you, will time, you will take time for the uh, young believers to know the Lord, for him to grow in grace and knowledge. So within this process, uh, sometimes you see the fruits and sometimes you don't see the fruits. But over time, when he's been taught the word of God and uh, to serve the Lord, I think he will grow and uh, he will mature in the faith. So I suppose it's quite critical that for young believers, they go through the uh, learning, uh, the process of uh, being uh, mentoring and uh, discipleship. Exactly. That's exactly what we're talking about here. That's the process of sanctification. See, If they have placed their trust in Christ genuinely as Savior, they're saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. And though they may not understand a lot of other things in the Christian life, but as they are mentored, as they are discipled, as they're grounded in the truths of the Word of God, the more exposure they have to the word of God, the more their thinking is renewed and their affections are being transformed mm. and their, their thought processes are, uh, are changing until they grow towards Christ. Like that's the process. It's not an overnight thing. It's called the process of sanctification. See, So <clears throat> I can cite examples in the Bible of people who you probably will not believe is a Christian, but the Bible says they are. Remember Lot, mm -hmm. if you just read Genesis chapter 19, imagine you are going to tell homosexuals outside your house, okay, why don't you just go out and get in my, get my, my daughters? What a despicable thing to do. And uh, so uh, is Lot a Christian? How could he do such a thing? Mm -hmm. But Peter says uh, Lot's soul was it vexed his righteous soul from day to day because of their unlawful deeds. He, so he was living in a culture of paganism and immorality. And what in the world is he doing there? So, but that's the problem. He, instead of influencing the culture with the gospel or with the truth, he was being influenced mm. instead. And yet he was a saved man. He was a just man, according to the inspired pen of, of, of Peter. So evidently, well, he was a just man. He's been justified, but the evidences of sanctification did not manifest, see. So it happens. See, Christians can fumble into serious sin. I mean, gen justified people, because like you said, justification is permanent, but sanctification is transitory. It has different degrees. Uh, but thankfully, if a person is genuinely justified, he is guaranteed to be glorified. Mm -hmm. So in the interim is our process of sanctification. And that's so if what does a, what should a Christian do if he manifests the flesh, if he sins, if he sings, he's not growing enough. See, number one, what does he do? Is it because he did not receive Christ as Lord? Was it there was something wrong in the way he received Christ? If he has trusted Christ as Savior, it's you don't go back, go back to when did you receive Christ? Did you receive him properly? No. If you have trusted in Christ as Savior, you can claim the promises of God, the purposes of God, all of those pillars. And if we manifest carnality, what do you do? First John 1 9, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Resting upon the sufficiency of Calvary, there's nothing to add to the finished work of Christ anyway. And then once you surrender your life to Christ, you're back to fellowship with God. You're again holy. See, remember, it's, uh, it's transit holiness is transitory. So you have surrendered your life to Christ and you're holy. You attend church, you're blessed with the message, and then you surrender your life to Christ in response to the word of God. Then you're holy. You're walking with God. But sometimes you go back and uh, you go to your parking lot and then start driving on the highway and somebody cuts you in the highway and, oh, and you can roll down your, your side mirror and start cursing. At that moment, you did lose your justification, but you lost your sanctification. Okay, maybe we have one more question. 
Uh, does the reform theologian uh, lean towards the lordship salvation? Many of these uh, people who uh, advocate lordship salvation, they are quite conservative in their teaching of the doctrine of China. So of the do of the doctrine of uh, lordship salvation. Yeah, so they're quite conservative of the of the doctrine. Yeah, they are usually quite conservative. Uh, the That's correct. Uh, is reform theology one of them? Uh, yes, quite frankly. I can, I can, I, I, here's, I, I'd like to suggest this. I'm not, uh, there is a video on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's entitled, It Will Cost You Everything. You can search it up. It will cost you everything. And the preacher there is, um, now let me see if my memory serves me right. Uh, oh boy, he comes here to the Philippines almost every year uh, until, until the lockdowns came. But he says, it will cost you everything unless you commit your life to Christ, unless you hate your father, mother, et cetera, et cetera. And unless you really give your all, you will be damned. I said, wow. <laughs> And if you're careful, you say, oh, wait a minute. So that makes me earning, earn my salvation. See, when the truth is, I cannot save myself. Even if I did, isn't it interesting what Paul said? Paul said, listen, in Philippians chapter three, all my best efforts are just trash. In other words, if my sins make me deserve hell, and here is my, I place it in the ledger, and here are my best shot and good works, and they're still not good enough. I count them trash. So that as I compare to the excellency of the righteousness of Christ. So that's why he clung to Christ's finished work. That's why he said, I'm not establishing my own rightness, Philippians chapter three. That's why he said it earlier in that chapter, he said, a genuine believer, we are the true circumcision who, were, who worship God in the spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus. And we have no confidence in the flesh how about a person who shows evidences of salvation all the tests but after some time he shows no interest in the things of the lord how do we think about him should we pray for him or for salvation <clears throat> uh, i can understand and sympathize that the, when you have a situation like that you begin to doubt is this person really saved uh, but it, there are instances in the Bible like that. If you'll remember in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle mentioned Hymenaeus and Philetus, and these were part of his gospel team. He would go with his missionary journeys and they brought him along. And then eventually these people denied the resurrection, say that the resurrection is past. That's the cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. They said, are these people really believers? And you know what he said there in 2 Timothy 2? I think it's in verse 19. He said, you know what? At the end of the day, the Lord knows them that are his. And therefore, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. See, we cannot see the heart of a person. We can only see the evidence of what is in his heart. So when that happens, that's when you begin to see that's how deep human depravity is. The depths of human depravity are so deep. That's why Je Jeremiah said, who can know it? Nobody can. See, the uh, heart is deceitful of all things. Who can know it? And then the next phrase says, the Lord is the one who searches the reins. So only the Lord knows the depths of depravity. So a person can go through the motions of religion externally, and then they convince us that they're saved. Because that's what James is saying, right? James is saying, faith without works is dead. You show me your faith. How do you show me your faith? By your works. You don't have to show that God, God your faith because God is God and he sees your faith. Mm -hmm. But you and I do not see each other's faith. And the only way we can show our faith is by our works. See, that's the fruit of the root. See, but sometimes we're misled. They show us the, the fruit, but there is no root. <laughs> see, and that's when, it's, and only the Lord knows that. The Lord knows them there is. That's why when a situation like that occurs, uh, there is reason to doubt the person's salvation. That's why Paul says, therefore, all those who name the name of Christ should depart from iniquity.
because that's the clearest evidence of genuine salvation see, is to depart from iniquity, to walk in holiness and sanctification.